a momentous year of news. In early spring, the great forces of nature brought havoc to Southern California. An unprecedented rainfall and record floods inundated an area of three million population, taking a toll of more than 100 lives and a property damage of 25 million. In late September, nature again rebelled. A West Indian hurricane, without warning, raked the Atlantic coastline. Hundreds of lives were lost. Homes, farms, land and sea transportation were demoralized and destroyed. The New England states were hardest hit. Thousands were rendered homeless by the fury of angry nature. A hundred and fifty million dollar hurricane. The East, worst tropical storm. All Holland applauds the royal christening of Crown Princess Juliana's baby girl. Later in the year, Queen Wilhelmina gains world acclaim when she celebrates 40 years of a happy, peaceful reign. In war-riddled Spain, brother continues to annihilate brother. Franco's insurgent army captures city after city. Hundreds of thousands of non-combatants suffer the indescribable horrors of a continuous nightmare of fear and destruction, a tragic price for power. China is crushed by Japan's modern engines of destruction. Throughout the year, Nippon's fighting hordes continue their conquest of China's principal cities. The good earth, trembles again and again in an irrepressible drive on Hankow. Seasoned troops storm the war-riddled path to China's capital. Resistance is shattered as the invading army pushes on from Peiping to Canton, from Shanghai to Hankow. Land and air forces relentlessly assault key defenses. Direct hits demolish city after city. Here, the invader's destruction takes no holiday. A grateful nation honors a brave sailor for heroism during the bombing of the ill-fated USS Panay. Lieutenant Anders struggled valiantly to aid startled survivors. To him, the Navy's coveted emblem of honor and the firm salute of a thankful nation. Highest honors from Queen's University at Kingston, Ontario. Here the United States Chief Executive attracts world comment with this unprecedented statement. I give to you assurance that the people of the United States will not stand idly by if domination of Canadian soil is threatened by any other empire. Later, he visits the newly completed Thousand Islands Bridge and joins with Canada's Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, in dedicating this true symbol of international peace and progress. Pomp and circumstance mark the royal visit to Paris of Britain's beloved George VI and Queen Elizabeth. France acclaims the monarchs as they ride through the historic boulevards of the nation's capital to the Arc de Triomphe. The magnificent state banquet crowns the events of an historic day. Later, King George at the tomb of France's unknown soldier pays humble tribute to France's World War hero. With Austria's surrender accomplished, Germany's Chancellor opens the 13th Nazi Congress at Nuremberg. Here he thunders his war threat to an anxious worldwide audience 
and demands the right to self-determination for 3,500,000 Sudeten Germans. President Benesch dramatically rejects Germany's ultimatum. Deep shadows of another world war spread over the universe. The small nation prepares for war as thousands of Sudetans flee to Germany. In mid-September, with Europe seemingly headed for disaster, England's Neville Chamberlain takes a now historic step. The Prime Minister flies to Berchtesgaden to personally plead for peace with the German Chancellor. All the world breathlessly awaits the outcome of this dramatic meeting. The deadline is October 1st. War now seems certain. France swells its armed forces to more than two million. Britain's home fleet is ordered to the North Sea, and simultaneously, the nation's armed resources are hurriedly mobilized. In London, riots break out among the people of a frenzied nation. Italy's Mussolini arouses his nation to support Germany. When another world war seems only hours away, the heads of the four powers hastily convene at Munich. The Sudeten land is surrendered. Hitler, Chamberlain, Mussolini, and Delarge jointly sign a memorable state document, and a new hope for world peace is born. October 1st, the Sudeten frontier gates are raised. Time and time alone will tell whether the Munich Pact means enduring peace for Europe and the world. Twenty years ago, the engines of war destroyed the Cathedral of Reims, a world-renowned shrine. Now philanthropy has restored this famed place of worship. Reims rises again, a majestic symbol of peace and happiness. At New Orleans, the 8th National Eucharistic Congress is held. Cardinal Munderlein imparts the sacred papal blessing to a vast audience, a solemn assembly of inspiration. England successfully launches the now famous pickaback plane, the Mercury. On its first flight, it crossed from Foynes, Ireland to Manhasset Bay, with a stop at Montreal, all in 25 hours. France's air achievement, a six-motored, 70-passenger sky mistress, arrives at Port Washington, Long Island, completing the first commercial transatlantic hop overseas. America's biggest transatlantic airplane is launched, another major contribution to aviation's forward march. Smashing all records, Howard Hughes outdoes Jules Verne's wildest dream. Around the world, from New York to New York, in four days. New aviation history is written when this Lockheed monoplane returns swiftly and safely with its crew of four. A real sportsman, a daring aviator, a true pioneer of the world's airways. On the heels of the Hughes flight, Douglas G, gone again Corrigan, and his nine-year-old trait make unexpected sky history. Corrigan flew the Atlantic by mistake and flew right into the hearts of the world. From New York to Ireland in 28 hours, then back to America, back to a waiting, cheering multitude. Here he is, wrong way Corrigan, who made the east the west, the west the east, and history upside down. most eventful year. Spain's three-year-old civil war ends, and Generalissimo Franco enters Barcelona. The victorious nationalist army passes in review. Brother no longer fights brother, as once again the sky is clear in war-weary Spain that rises from its sorrow to begin life anew.
ocean reaches new heights. The Atlantic becomes a smaller ocean, only a day's journey from the new world to the old, as the Yankee Clippers inaugurate regular mail and passenger flights between the two hemispheres. With ace transport pilots and every modern safety device, the Clipper wings its way high above the clouds and beyond the reach of angry seas. Passengers enjoy modern comforts as the short hours pass pleasantly. A safe landing from its lofty path above the sea lanes that once were sailed by the Clippers of old. London, as King George and Queen Elizabeth return from the historic journey to the New World. The humble and the great join in an historic ovation. The same royal carriage in which they rode away now carries them back to Buckingham Palace. Their loyal subjects see them at home again, grateful for their safe return. France, too, has an occasion of rejoicing. Bastille Day is celebrated with the greatest parade in French history. Britain soldiers join in the march as Paris thrills to a display of allied power. France celebrates the 150th birthday of its freedom. Colonial troops of North Africa demonstrate their loyalty, and millions respond with loud cheers of Vive la France! The Arc de Triomphe looks down again on marching troops as France and Britain's defenders march together, not knowing that destiny will soon again join them as allies in armed conflict. Nature goes on a rampage and leaves destruction and havoc in its wake. Here in the heart of the earthquake zone, untold thousands of buildings topple in ruins as great crevices are split in the earth. Soldiers search for those who perished in Chile's tragic disaster. Twenty cities are laid low as houses crumble like broken crackers. President Serda inspects the devastated area as with heavy hearts, the natives start to rebuild their stricken country. The United States Navy suffers a tragic disaster. A drama of sorrow is written when the submarine squalus plunges to the bottom of the sea off the North Atlantic coast. The staunch rescue ship Falcon speeds from its base and the work of saving the gallant crew gets underway. A new type of rescue bell goes into action as divers and Navy experts strive frantically to reach the trapped officers and men. After many nerve-straining minutes, the rescue bell is raised, and with it come 33 of the crew, but 26 are trapped in the flooded compartments. Then, with huge pontoons and pumps, three attempts are made to raise the ill-fated submarine. Finally, the surface boils as the ship rises, and a tragic sea epic is sadly written in the history of a nation. In the Orient, Japan continues its undeclared war against China and creates acute diplomatic tension by barricading the British concession at Tinsin. For a time, the entry of foodstuffs is prohibited. Sentry control is established. Unrest in the Far East continues as nations and peoples await the inevitable solution. Nature, too, contributes to China's man-made trouble. One of the worst floods in Cathay's history devastates the already sorely tried Tin Sin, 
to inundated streets and make thousands homeless. The Paul Horsemen have always ridden roughshod over China, but she always seems to survive, for her people smile at disaster, believing that the waters will again recede as the tense struggle to live goes on. Cupid has his problems too, and in Canada he solves them in a wholesale way. Here in Montreal, over a hundred couples gather in the open to be married simultaneously. And they will live happily ever after. Obviously, there is some love left in the worried world of today. Germany invades Poland in the free state of Danzig. The efforts and hopes of diplomats for peaceful settlement are transformed into the roar of gunfire. Warsaw is bombed, blasted and shelled. Poland is in ruin. Great Britain and France declare war on Germany. Huge French guns move to the front and its army to the great man-made Maginot Line, the nation's first bulwark of defense. Britain safely transports a quarter of a million officers and men across the English Channel to France's shores. The Allies' greatest weapon to wipe out forever the recurrent fear of aggression lies in their domination of the sea. One of the worst conflagrations of the year takes place in Chicago where man's common enemy strikes with flaming ferocity. Huge grain elevators burst into white-hot infernos as brave firefighters strive to quench the flames with tons of water. Millions of dollars go up in smoke. Hundreds of cattle are menaced. The surrounding buildings are left black and charred. South America go United States naval cruisers and a goodwill voyage of peacetime activity. We're aboard the USS San Francisco, looking back at the sturdy warships, plowing Cape Horn's heavy seas and riding out the gale's fury. The waves pound mercilessly against these ocean greyhounds as the wind reaches hurricane velocity. Mountainous seas seem to completely submerge the ships as they plow through the raging main, conquering the angry waters and headed for safe harbors ahead. The bulldogs of the Navy forge onward in Neptune's turbulent waters, symbols of the might of right in a world of heavy seas.